Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and we are continuing with chapter 10. Today we're going to cover chapter 10.2, liquids. So liquids in general have a definite volume, have an indefinite shape, are free-flowing, so their particles can move freely um, between one another. That's what gives them their fluidity. They are uh, able to roll over one another, etc. Uh, they are a condensed state of matter with higher density than a gas, and they are relatively incompressible. So you remember we said with gases, the particles are small relative to the volume of whatever container that they're in. And so the particles of a gas are far apart, where with liquids they're closer together, they have lower energy than gases, remember kinetic theory, and they're relatively incompressible. That means that you can't compress them, you can't smush them closer together because they're already pretty close together. They have the ability to diffuse and they exhibit something called surface tension. So here is an example of a liquid flowing fluidity. And again, this is an example of diffusion and it's two different colors of dye in a container of water. So I will post for you guys a video that I did of two liquids diffusing. So surface tension. By definition, it's the force that tends to pull parts of a liquid surface together, so increase, decreasing the surface area to the smallest possible size. And it's what causes bugs and leaves to be able to, in the case of bugs, walk in case of leaves float on water. So here is an example on the surface of a pond, perhaps, or a lake, a bug that's kind of floating on the surface. And this is an example of a droplet. And what causes surface tension is the attraction of the molecules of whatever that liquid is, the attraction to one another. So again, surface tension is what causes droplets to form and what causes uh, things to be able to float on the surface of a liquid. So surface tension is related to capillary action and that's the attraction of the surface of a liquid to the surface of a solid. And again it's related to surface tension. It has to do with intermolecular forces of attraction. So you remember we've talked in the past <clears throat> about hydrogen bonding and about dipole-dipole interactions. And again, it's responsible for a meniscus that forms in our graduated cylinder, and it's also responsible for how plants can absorb water through their roots, and also how paper products can pick up water, paper towel or a napkin can pick up water off of the surface of a table or of a counter. So again, in the case of plant roots and plant um, stems, you've got your xylem, which is uh, capillary action up from, for instance, the ground up, and phloem is the um, liquid flowing down. And again, in our graduated cylinder, the attraction of water to the surface of the glass is what causes the meniscus to form. So um, last year in biology, you might have done paper chromatography of plant pigments, where you take a piece of paper, a strip of paper, you dot the plant pigment on it, you put it in a dish of water, the water climbs up and brings with it the plant pigments, and it might have looked more like this. And again, later on this year, when we talk about water specifically, we'll do um, a little experiment with uh, surface tension and with... Um, capillary action will do paper chromatography. So then the other thing we talk about with liquids is vaporization. The definition of vaporization is the term used for the conversion of a liquid to a gas or vapor below its boiling point. And if you think about if I spill water on the counter and I come back four days later there won't be any water left on the counter. The water never boiled but it vaporized. It was able to go from liquid to gas and it wasn't at its boiling point. And again, it's the general term used for the escape of molecules um, at the surface of a liquid from the liquid to the gas. And it can be in an open or a closed container. And again, here is vaporization on what looks to be a lake. And again, you can see the liquid uh, turning to gas, and you can actually see the water vapor in the air, kind of foggy looking. 
So evaporation is related to vaporization, but evaporation is specifically talking about just the escape from the surface of a non-boiling liquid to the gas phase at the surface. So again, when we talk about evaporation, we're talking about just at the surface, where vaporization can be occurring throughout a liquid. So vapor pressure is the pressure of a vapor over its liquid. And again, the vaporized particles are colliding with the walls of a sealed container or at the surface of a liquid. And we refer to that pressure as the vapor pressure. And again, it's defined as the pressure of a vapor over its liquid. So if you have a water bottle in the summer in your car, you might notice it gets all foggy at the top. And that is because the liquid is vaporizing. It can escape because there's a cap on your water bottle. And so it actually builds up a pressure. And what eventually will happen is some of that liquid will reach the top of the bottle and it'll condense and drop back down. So there's kind of an equilibrium taking place. So again, the particles are entering the vapor, and if they condense, they go back down to a liquid, and then they can go back to a vapor. So again, that is what's happening, for instance, in a closed bottle. And if you think about when you open a bottle of soda, you always hear that sound, and what's happening is the pressure builds up of the gas, in that case carbon dioxide, and when you open the cap, you release that pressure, and that's what makes the little s sound. So vapor pressure is also related to the definition for boiling. When a liquid begins to boil, it's when the vapor pressure equals whatever the external pressure is. So if you think about water, in order for water to boil, when you've got it on a stove, it actually starts to bubble when the vapor pressure of the water molecules reaches the point where it equals the external pressure in the room, which should be about 1 atm or 760 millimeters of mercury. And at that point, the liquid can change to a gas at all points. And that's what boiling is defined as. So as the pressure in a room changes, the boiling point changes. So if you've ever looked at a cake mix or um, muffin mix or whatever, and you'll see it has high altitude directions. That's because the pressure above a liquid changes its boiling point. So boiling point is defined as when the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. So if you're at the top of Mount Everest, for in instance, where atmospheric pressure is very low, atmospheric pressure goes down as you climb in altitude, water might boil at the top of Mount Everest at, I think it's 90 degrees C, whereas at sea level, water boils at 100 degrees C. So the vapor pressure depends on the atmospheric pressure. So the vapor pressure um, at standard pressure, so at sea level, is 1 atm, and the normal boiling point of a liquid is referred to where it boils at standard pressure. Remember our standard pressure and temperature when we were talking about moles. So the normal boiling point is the boiling point where pressure is 1 atm, and that is, for water, 100 degrees C. So we use something called a vapor pressure graph, or a vapor pressure diagram, diagram to determine the boiling point of a liquid at any pressure. So vapor pressure diagrams look something like this. And so here, this is pressure in millimeters. And remember, atmospheric pressure um, at sea level is 760 millimeters, which is somewhere up here. So this is showing you various pressures, and it's showing you the temperature. And so if we were looking at these two liquids, and I asked at standard pressure, where does liquid A boil? I would go here, 760, and I would go across till I encountered liquid A, and then I would read down its temperature, and that is, it looks like about, oops, sorry, about 72 degrees C. And if I were looking for 
standard pressure where liquid B would boil, I would go across here and I would read down and I would see that it looks like it's halfway between 110 and 120. So at standard atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters, liquid B would boil at 760. That means that's where its vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. So this is all what the vapor pressure of the liquid is at various temperatures. So at what temperature would they boil if the pressure was only 400 millimeters? So if we go over here, 400 millimeters looks like about 52 degrees C. And for liquid B, 400 millimeters looks like it would boil at 95 degrees C. So again, this is another series of vapor pressure diagrams. So if we were to look here, this is the temperature, and this is what the vapor pressure of those liquids is. And so again, if I wanted to know at standard pressure, 760 millimeters, where, for instance, diethyl ether uh, would boil, what temperature, it would be where its pressure equals standard atmospheric pressure, and so that would be 34.6 degrees C. If we were looking at um, ethyl alcohol, ethanol, and we looked at standard pressure, its temperature is about 78.3 degrees C. And if we're looking, for instance, at water, water has a vapor pressure of 760 at 100 degrees C. The other thing that we can notice here about vapor pressure diagrams is intermolecular forces of attraction. The less there are forces of attraction between the particles, the lower the boiling. So on this diagram, the liquid that has the least intermolecular force of attraction between its particles would be diethyl ether. You can see that water has very high intermolecular force of attraction, so it boils high. And if we could extrapolate ethylene glycol, it would be somewhere out, way out here at like 200, and so ethylene glycol would show the highest intermolecular force of attraction. So this is Ms. Augustine talking about vapor pressure diagrams and signing off for today.